Idi Amin, Genghis Khan, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Chairman Mao, Pol Pot. What do all of these people have in common? It's not toxic masculinity. The key trait they all share is that for all the horror they unleashed, they all believed they were on the right side of history. And that's a phrase we hear a lot these days from activists. It's a self-justifying cliche that doesn't really mean anything beyond an expression of moral certainty. But if you're a good person, do you really have to keep saying that you're good? Isn't it more about how you behave and how you treat your fellow human beings? Maybe activists have to keep claiming they're on the right side of history because it's so clear to everyone else that they're not. This week, the swimming champion, Riley Gaines, was physically assaulted at San Francisco State University by protesters who don't like the fact that she believes that sport ought to be segregated by sex. She was there to give a speech, not have a fight. But nonetheless, she was allegedly hit by a man in a dress multiple times. She was trapped in a room for three hours while security guards negotiated with activists the terms of her release. There's even a clip in which they're heard suggesting she could pay them for her freedom. Now, I'm no legal expert, but this all sounds like it's skirting dangerously close to kidnap. But there have been no arrests. The university hasn't disciplined those students who are effectively there to prevent free speech. So apparently, this kind of behaviour is just fine. Again and again, activists keep proving our points for us. We say these are authoritarians. They respond by trying to silence their critics, often by violence and intimidation. We say that women need single-sex spaces as a form of safeguarding against the violent minority of men. And then large groups of men turn up and terrorise and assault women. Over the past few weeks, I've been covering the clear escalation and the violent rhetoric from activists who promote gender identity ideology. And I keep returning to this because it's clearly one of the greatest threats to free speech of our time. But we do need to ask ourselves where it's all leading. It is perhaps hyperbole to invoke Stalin and Mao and all the other tyrannies of history. And I'm not for one minute suggesting we're anywhere close to that. But it's important to recognise that these activists do share that fundamental authoritarian instinct. They don't want to persuade you. They want to force you into accepting their beliefs. They don't want to have a discussion about sensitive and complicated matters. They want to shut you up so that they can't be opposed. They're not burning heretics at the stake, but I'm not so sure that they wouldn't if they had the chance. Consider the example of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a writer who was sentenced to eight years in forced labor camps for a letter that he wrote that was critical of Stalin. Now, he wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, which was all about the Stalinist regime that went on to be responsible for in excess of 20 million deaths. And this is what Solzhenitsyn says about a daylight arrest in which someone is being led by crowds, by guards, through a crowd. He says, you aren't gagged. You really can and you really ought to cry out that arrests are being made on the strength of false denunciations, that millions are being subjected to silent reprisals, if many such outcries had been heard all over the city in the course of a day, would not our fellow citizens perhaps have begun to bristle? And would arrests perhaps no longer have been so easy? In other words, tyranny doesn't come about overnight. Our liberties erode gradually, like ice from a glacier. And with that in mind, let's take a look at this. Now, this is a member of parliament in Ontario, Canada, who was calling for legislation to criminalise, among other things, offensive remarks. Firstly, it enables the Attorney General to create a 2S LGBTQI plus community safety zone to prohibit within 100 meters of the property any homophobic, transphobic act of intimidation, threat, offensive threats, offensive remarks, protest, disturbance, and distribution of hate propaganda within the meaning of the uh, criminal code. It also comes with it a penalty of $25,000 if prosecuted successfully. So this happened just this week. The NDP's Kristen Wong Tam tabled this motion in order to create what she calls 2SLGBTQI plus community safety zones in response to protests that have occurred against drag shows aimed at children. Now, I'm sure that some of those protesters have crossed the line into harassment and intimidation. But of course, such behaviour is already illegal. And yet I can't help but notice that most of the bullying and violent behaviour we've seen from protesters has been coming from those who consider themselves to be members of the 2S LGBTQIA plus activist community. Would Wong Tam's proposed legislation be used against the kind of people that we'll see on the screen in a moment? I somehow doubt these are the kind of protesters that Wong Tam has in mind. Now, I should be clear that this is a motion 
tabled by a backbencher from a party that isn't in power, thank God. But it is very revealing about the kind of mindset I'm talking about, particularly that phrase, offensive remarks. We have hate speech laws here in the UK which have seen people criminalised for jokes because they're deemed grossly offensive. Countries across Europe have various hate speech laws, none of which are consistent or clearly defined. Because once you attempt to legislate against causing offence, you're taking the first step on a very dark path. Because offence, as we all know, is hopelessly subjective. That's why Humza Youssef, who vehemently pushed through his hate speech bill in Scotland, was recently reported to the police for breaking the law that he himself established. One might even say that the attempt to legislate against offensive speech is, in itself, offensive. So maybe the Canadian police will take action against the NDP's Kristen Wong Tam. Which brings us back to the so-called right side of history. Now, I'm sure that many of the politicians who are trying to curb our free speech are doing so because they think it's best for us or that it protects marginalised groups. They are, of course, doing untold harm to the very people they claim to be protecting because no civil rights have ever been won or sustained without free speech. And really, it's up to all of us to take a stand when these gradual attacks on liberal values occur. We may not be heading for a world of gulags, but we shouldn't be fostering the very mindset that created them or failing to make the case for free speech at a time when authoritarianism is deemed to be fashionable and morally correct. The old adage that it, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but I'm not so worried about those doing the paving. I'm more worried about the rest of us who are standing by in silence and watching them as they work.